so confident they'll make the playoffs that if they don't, I'll wear a Giants or a Dodgers jersey on one of our podcasts. You don't need the pressure of, of always trying to perform here at the major league level, so that might be a good thing. He talked about the athleticism of this Padres team uh, last time out, and he just embodies it. Greetings, everybody, from America's finest city. It's another edition of the BCSC podcast. Andy Bishop joined by my good friends, Thomas Conroy and Brian Vilvin. My, my friends, it is an off day here in San Diego, so it's a chance for us to breathe and try to ingest what has happened in the last 72 hours for the San Diego Padres, the most exciting team in MLB. Uh, Baseball. Can you believe I'm saying those words, Brian? I can't. I mean, I, I love it, and it's been that way for uh, for a little over a month now. But if you had told me this while we were in quarantine, wondering if there was even going to be a baseball season, if you had told me that this was what we were going to be looking at on September 1st, I don't know if I would have believed it. Yeah, you know, I think we were expecting the Padres to at least be somewhat active, uh, given the um, their record, the, the success they've had, and that they may be in a position to be buyers. But Thomas, could you have envisioned that six trades would happen for our Padres going into the deadline? Yeah, and the sixth one I didn't even hear about until 9 o'clock last night. That one, like, snuck by the goaltender. I was like, wow. When did that happen? Uh, yeah, I mean, getting to your point, really, Andy, it was it was truly amazing. Uh, you know, we all as fans have probably wish lists of what we wanted to see done at the trade deadline. But, I mean, you know, for me, if, if they could have gotten, you know, a, a, you know, a good hitting catcher that, that could play well behind the plate, I would have been – I would have been happy with just that addition alone. But, I mean, they, they filled out my entire checklist for the off season. I mean, I don't know where we can go after this. I mean, Prelo just, you know, just did an amazing job. And, and to acquire all, you know, the acquire a relief pitcher like Trevor Rosenthal, get obviously the starting pitcher, Mike Clevenger, and Mitch Moreland, you know, uh, another, another left-handed hitting hitter, uh, without giving up anybody in, in, your, in your top ten of, uh, of your – of your prospects and not add on significant salary. I mean, if you don't give him a tip of your hat, you're, 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 you're missing the whole point. I mean, that was just a great job. Well said, Thomas, I will give a tip of my cap to <laughs> general manager, AJ Preller. I had to go with an emergency purchase of a hat today. I woke up with the, the AJ Preller haircut out of control. And so I had to, <laughs> had to try to cover it up. Uh, but, Brian, it, you know, it seems like this plan has been in place to some degree uh, from Preller as they, uh, you know, signed a, a ton of these pros, prospects going back to 2016, 2017 to uh, give them uh, some leverage to go out and, and buy uh, some of these big names. Uh, Thomas, you mentioned Clevenger, uh, Mitch Moreland, uh, but, but these six trades in total, they also add uh, catcher Austin Nola from uh, the Seattle Mariners. Brian, they really addressed – all of their needs. Uh, what do you have to say about AJ Preller? Just, uh, I love the fact that uh, it actually came to fruition because years ago, uh, and I know in 2015, we were all really fired up that he came in and went and acquired the Uptons and Matt Kemp and Craig Kimbrell and uh, James Shields. Like that at the time was amazing like the Padres were finally relevant we went from this bottom feeder for you know a, a decade basically and to a playoff contender and then a couple months in we just blew the whole thing up and realized it didn't work but that wasn't the the approach he wanted to take he was kind of pressured into that and then like you said in the uh, the 2016 draft and international signing period he went out and really replenished things and it was tough at the time to sit around and wait and we've been for the last few years the the number one farm system in all of baseball and like yeah that's exciting and you think about what could be but it's also really hard to be patient as a fan like you want to win in the meantime um and everybody talked about you know originally it was oh wait till 2020 then it was always going to be 2021 maybe 2022 so the fact that we're doing it in 2020 a year probably earlier than everybody anticipated uh, it's just really exciting. 
I'm glad that ownership and management decided to keep AJ around because I really liked the approach he's taken once he could get his guys in and, and really see things through. Um, so thankfully the, the upper management and ownership has been patient with him as well uh, to let this plan come to be because like you guys talked about, we didn't even give up the, uh, the prizes of our farm system to make all these trades happen. And it's not like we traded uh, just to be relevant this year. Most of the people that we traded for are under control for the next couple of years. So this is uh, just, again, it's going to be, we don't need to go out and get a marquee anybody moving forward. We just need to fill in little gaps here and there with some uh, complimentary players and unbelievable. I, I just, it's so awesome to see. And he really is the rock star GM, like the moniker we gave <laughs> at the beginning. Yeah. So again, I'll just kind of go over the main positions we targeted. So Austin Nola, a 300 hitter, a catcher from the Mariners, um, essentially replaces Austin Hedges. So an upgrade there. Uh, we get Trevor Rosenthal from Kansas City to uh, be in our bullpen, possibly our, our closer here for the next couple of years, depending on what happens with Kirby Yates and some of our other younger guys in the bullpen. Mike Clevenger, the, the huge grab, a uh, starting pitcher that's had a sub three ERA the last couple of years, postseason experience uh, with Cleveland. And then Mitch Moreland, another big bat that can uh, fill in as a DH or uh, play first base for Hosmer. So another big bat in the middle of the lineup there. Thomas, as you look at this lineup, one through nine, I mean, once we get Fam back, uh, who of course has been injured for the last couple of weeks, you have a, a team that's filled with guys hitting over 250, 275. That's something we haven't seen in years from the Padres. Yeah, I mean, it, it's to me, it's the most complete lineup in the National League. I, I don't see an easy out when, when you when you when you put that lineup together, and it's really you know, it, and and you can actually kind of maneuver the middle of your order depending on who you're pitching, you're going against uh, that starting pitcher that night. So, you know, it's very versatile. You know, you, you, you love it at the top. Grisham and Tatis Jr. are, you know, speed demons, and they, and they really run the base as well. I mean, the, it's hard to imagine that a team that's leading the league and runs scored could actually, you know, uptick their numbers with, the, with these acquisitions. And, uh, you know, I, I just love it. And, you know, I just love the order. It, it's it's going to be, you know, it, it makes now everybody's at bat almost much watch. I remember we, we talked about it before about Tatis Jr. being must watch. Now it just seems like I can't miss anybody's at bat because a, a big inning could start anywhere in the order at, at any time in the game. Yeah, great analysis there, Thomas. Uh, so the Padres take three or four from the Rockies this past weekend. Uh, they now take on the AL West uh, in five games, a, a team in the age, the Angels that has uh, struggled, and then a little bit more f formidable opponent with the uh, Oakland Athletics. Brian, uh, I'll go back to your prediction a couple weeks ago <laughs> when you said uh, the Padres in the next 16 games would go 11 and five. Where are we at with that one? Right now, the Padres are 11-3 and three in 14 games. So they've got two more against the Angels. That's where I came up with, like, the 16 number. And at the time, it was like, oh, what, how'd you come up with 16 games to project? Well, that was the games, you know, right before the A's. So I didn't want to include that because I figured at the time that was going into Oakland, a series that you, you know, you're happy to take. You'd, you'd, happy, you'd be happy for two out of three, but likely, like, a you know, win one game and get the heck out of Oakland. But, uh, yeah, so right now – it comes back to that same thing we'd always talked about where if they lose these two in Anaheim, I'm going to be <laughs> upset. I'm not going to be happy. So even though my prediction would have been right 11 and five, now I want them to go 13 and three in that time. And they're going to be a huge favorite in the two games against the angels. So yeah, I'll, uh, I'll no longer be happy with that 11 and five prediction. I like that 13 and three. I mean, Things look good. Our starting pitching will have Denelson Lamette going, I believe, in the first game, and then probably Mike Clevenger uh, making his Padres debut in game two. Yeah, so I, I do want to say one thing about that. I kind of hope Clevenger doesn't pitch against the Angels um, and that he throws against the A's because then looking forward, um, he would line up to pitch against the Dodgers. And if he pitches that second game against the Angels, he would miss the Dodgers. So on one hand, like, yeah, maybe you want to wait so the Dodgers, the first time they see him is in the postseason, uh, theoretically. But I'd also like to go in there and uh, and have him go through that lineup and just, you know, 
shut them down and kind of shut up all the uh, all the Dodger people out there and <laughs> put our stomp our foot down and show them who's boss. And I think he gives us a better shot against Oakland. So kind of hope he doesn't pitch against uh, against the A's. After uh, all the trades went down, I texted a couple people and I said, Dodgers, Padres, NLCS. I guarantee it. The, well, so the problem with that now, because of the new playoff schedule, is that hey, our teams are both going to be one and four. They're going to have to play in the second round. So even if they have the two best records, they, they pretty much can't play in the uh, championship series Good unless point. the Padres dropped all the way down to sixth, which, you know, I don't think there's two other teams that can pass them. So if we get slotted in the four or five or win the division and the Dodgers end up four or five, then we'll have to play them in the divisional series. So kind of a bummer there because the CS would be really cool. But, yeah. hey, a five-game series against the Dodgers – we could win three of those in our sleep. <laughs> well, a lot, a lot of exciting things going on for our Padres. I mean, it's, it's been so long. And, and maybe this is the best all-around team that we've had in the Padres' entire stinking history. Uh, aside from the new moves, uh, I'll go back to kind of the, some of the original guys we've seen for the first half of the season. Um, some guys that we, we really didn't expect to have the success they have had. So I'll, I'll turn to both of you. I'll start with you, Thomas. Who has been your most pleasant surprise in a Padres uniform this year? Well, I'm going to pick a guy that I wrote, I wrote about uh, for Fan Sided and said that he needs to leave town ASAP. And, well, he's proven me wrong. And thank God we didn't trade him when, when I suggested it during the last winter. It's Will Myers. I mean, he's been really just a rock solid player, and and he finally seems like he, guys. He he's kind of caught his his groove in the outfield. I mean, I I think he's played a tremendous defensive right field for the team this year, and uh, you know, and obviously his bat is electric, and and that was always I think the attraction to him, and when 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 you know when when he got that extension was just what kind of force he could be at times. At, at the plate from the, you know, in the right-hand uh, hitter's box. I mean, his, his back control and just his, the way he just goes right through, you know, when, when he's on a streak, he can literally carry a team for a few weeks. It's pretty impressive. And, uh, you know, to me, it, he just seems like a more comfortable player than, than I've ever seen him during his time here in San Diego. And, and I think he kind of just threw everything at, at, uh, probably off his back, you know, with, with all the rumors. And, and, and if you remember when, when Ron Fowler kind of said, <laughs> tore him down during that, during that fan summit at the end of last season, I think he just said, you know what, I'm just going to go out and play my game. And if they don't like me, they don't like me, but I'm not going to try to be the, whatever type of player they, they thought I was, I'm just going to play within myself. And boy, he's come through in, in flying colors this year. Yeah, real, real nice to see that. A guy that uh, Padre fans weren't really thrilled with. They've, you know, they tried him out at first base, center field, left field, and he just ne was never really comfortable defensively. So that's also the, the mm -hmm. thing for me is that he seems to be really comfortable now this season out there in right field. Brian, who you got on this one? Well, I'm going to go to, uh, to the pitcher's mound, and I'm going to say Zach Davies. Davies has been an absolute workhorse for the Padres this year. He's five and two. Um, he's got a 2.5 ERA. His whip, his walks and hits per inning pitch is under one, which is like massive, you know, Cy Young type of, uh, of number. And he's striking out almost a batter every inning. And more importantly, he's averaging six innings per start. And uh, for her, a team that every fifth day so far this season has had a bullpen day, uh, it's so important to have someone who consistently goes six innings. And in today's game of baseball, that is a ton for a starter. Most star starters across the league are averaging four and a half innings uh, per start. So to have him going six innings every single time and consistently keeping you in ball games, uh, Zach Davies is the one for me. Well, he was kind of, you know, when the trade happened, it was exciting. It was like, oh, this, this is a nice pitcher. Um, and then Trent Grisham's probably going to be pretty good, but I, I couldn't see either of those guys doing what they've done to contribute to this team. And if Zach Davies wasn't part of this rotation, then the Padres would not be where they are right now. Yeah, I'll go over to another trade that happened this offseason, and that was the one uh, with the Tampa Bay Rays that brought Tommy Pham and Jake Cronenworth here. 
got to go with Jay Cronenworth. We've talked about him all season long. And I swear every series that goes on, I continue to be more impressed with him. His defense, we've seen him with a couple of those great little scoops from second base over to first. He also showed that he can play first base and shortstop. So he's very much a versatile uh, player. But then at the plate, he just has such good uh, plate presence. Uh, just gives you so many good at bats. He shows you that he has power, that he can hit, um, you know, for average as well. So to have that guy at second base, uh, so, so key for the Padres here in 2020. A guy that very likely could be the rookie of the year, leads in, you know, a lot of categories. A guy that's 26 years old, so he's kind of, you know, made his way through the minors the last few years. I, I like that you have a guy like that as well as, I'll go back to um, our acquisition of Austin Nola, a catcher, a guy that's 30 years old that, you know, is in one of her, his early years in Major League Baseball. So guys like that have, that have been tried and true through the minors, um, I think they give you uh, some substance with this uh, team this year. So I'm going with, with Cronenworth. And then I'll add to, to your point, Thomas, uh, a guy like Will Myers, uh, a high salary guy, he was getting a lot of flack this offseason, a lot of along with our big guys, Manny Machado and Eric Hosmer, who, you know, underperformed last year, but have been uh, in, immensely uh, successful in the middle of our lineup. So, uh, I mean, it's just all these things coming together. Uh, it is incredible to see. Yeah, the, uh, the exciting thing is that when you say who's been the most impactful Padre, there's so many answers you could go with. <laughs> and all of them, you know, you have positive arguments for each one and why they've been the most impactful one. Uh, which kind of gets back to the general manager. And Andy, maybe you want to talk a little bit about A.J. Preller. The guy I talked about was an acquisition. The guy you talked about was an acquisition. The guy Thomas talked about, Thomas wanted to send on a, the next train out of town. So uh, how about A.J. Preller keeping this whole thing together and, uh, and getting everybody peaking at the same time? Yeah, I absolutely love it. You know, there was a lot of talk this offseason that this could be Preller's last stand, right? He – he tried to go big with, you know, the up, Upton and Kemp era. Um, that didn't work out. That fizzled, uh, you know, several very unsuccessful years in terms of wins the last three or four years. Uh, you know, so this was kind of his big chance. Everybody was talking the 2020-2021 Padres. Can they, can they do it? And he made the acquisitions in the offseason. Uh, he made the acquisitions this year during the middle of the season. So. Got to love what he's doing. The, the rock star GM is back in San Diego. Um, and then, you know, we, we've talked about him bringing in Jace Tingler, uh, a relatively unknown guy. Uh, you know, it's easy to bypass what he's done because of all the talented players we have there. I guess I'll ask you, Thomas, um, what do you think of Tingler as we continue here in the 2020 season? I think he's done an excellent job. I mean, you know, it's, you know, I, I think when you, you when your first season as as a major league manager is in a in an in a, you know in a sixty game you know death race to uh, to October, <laughs> I mean it's not the ideal circumstances to kind of get your feet wet. And uh, he's done a great job. Yeah, I mean you know we can all pick and choose games where where we scratch our heads at some of his moves, but. You know, in the end, I, I always feel like, you know, these managers know their team way, way better than, than we do. And he's just done an excellent job. I haven't seen any, anything outrageous where I was like, what is he thinking, you know, in that area? And, and really what, what, what I like is the communication level between him and Pro. They, they, we finally seem to have a, a, a partnership at the general manager and the manager position. And, and, and for some reason in San Diego – that's always been a problem. I mean, if you look at it from the old days with the Chargers, with A.J. Smith and Marty Schottenheimer, they butted heads constantly until one had to go, and then eventually they both left. These guys seem like they know each other because they worked with each other before, and they, they understand each other. And, you know, really the MVP for, for all of this season, to me, is, is, a, is the executive chairman, Ron Fowler, because if he doesn't say – things better change or heads will roll. I don't, you know, would we have had this season? I don't know. But, uh, you know, it, I just love it. it, it we're, we're talking Padres baseball and, it, and it's all positive and it isn't about, you know, you know, usually at this time in past seasons, we talked about players that, that, that were shipped out of here instead of being brought in here. So all, all good from my end from, from the way this franchise is going. 
I'll make just a, two quick points again about Preller. I mentioned the, you know, how things kind of didn't work out with the Shields and Upton, uh, you know, attempts there. But remember, it was James Shields that we traded away to get prospect <laughs> Fernando Tatis Jr. That may go down as the most notable move that Preller has made. Uh, and then I'll go back to Cronenworth, who I was talking about at second base. He was part of the Tommy Pham trade. And that may go down, as we've talked about, as the Jake Cronenworth <laughs> trade when it's yeah. all said and done. Who knows? Absolutely. But Tommy Pham really, uh, you know, didn't have a lot of su success in the early part of the season. He gets injured. He was hitting in that number two, number three spot. When he returns maybe mid-September to late September, he may be back <laughs> number seven or number eight with the, the way yeah. this lineup is turning out. Brian, what, what are you expecting from this Padres team? What is something – maybe one specific thing that you're keeping an eye on during this last month here in September. Well, I'll just say one more thing about uh, AJ Preller. The, the fact that he hired Jace Tingler when the easy thing would have been to try to go out and hire a big name manager. Instead, he found someone he knew if this is my last stand, he wanted to go find someone who had exactly his mindset. They knew each other from the Texas days. And he's like, this guy and I will be on the same page. This is the guy I want here. This is the guy to lead the team. So another move to you know a courageous move by Preller to try to save his bacon by putting in a guy who he had full confidence in who we didn't know but it doesn't matter because he knows so much more about everything than any of us but that's the last thing I'll say on that um one thing I'm looking looking at right now um and it was something that at the beginning of the season we talked about we thought it was going to be the strength of this team and then in the first month of the season it was by far the weakest link and that was the bullpen over the last week so one week ago the Padres bullpen ranked 25th in all of baseball. Uh, and coming into today, the bullpen ranks 14th. So they moved up nine spots in the bullpen ranks uh, just in one week. So this bullpen is starting to come together. Uh, they have had to deal with some injuries and things like that, but they had a really solid week. And I'm looking forward to seeing how the bullpen responds the rest of the way, because if this bullpen can be the, the asset that we thought it was going to be at the beginning of the season and some of these new names can come in and, and be uh, shut down like that, then the Padres, they're right there with the Dodgers as, you know, potentially the best team in the National League. And uh, this is a legitimate World Series threat. Uh, so the bullpen is the thing I'm keeping my eye on. They, uh, they had a really good week. Let's go have another good week this week. Yeah, we are – correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're 22-15 and 15 is our record. Yep. We were 37 games, so we've got 23 left. Thomas, what's the key for you uh, down this final stretch for the Padres? I think it was something that Brian hit on early uh, is, is how they're going to align their, their rotation. Because to me, uh, you, know, you know, I want that Dodgers series in the postseason, uh, you know, because I really want to match up with them. I, I want – if it's going to be Paddock in the number one spot and, and we got promising, you know, a promising outing from him – at Coors Field over the weekend, I I, I really want to I want to I want them to line it up and and I want and I want those matchups. I want Paddock versus Bueller. I want Clevenger or Lamette versus Kershaw, and then I want the the other pitcher to go the to go against the the Dodgers number number three guy. And 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 you know I I you know when 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 you listen to the to the media around the country, you know on ESPN and major league uh, MLB network and, and, and Fox it's, it, that's the point that, that they, that they, that they come at. I mean, that's the main point when we heard about the Clevenger trade was, you know, now that the Padres have a, have a starting rotation that's going to match the Dodgers. And, you know, and now we've taken away their strength and I don't think their bullpen is, is as good as, as ours. So, you know, that's where I think our advantage is. We, we have a, we, you know, we have a very good lineup. You know, we have equal, uh, equal starting pitching and we have the advantage in the bullpen and, you know, I'm ready to go, man. I mean, can we just get to October? I mean, I'm really, <laughs> I'm, I'm ready right now. I mean, to me, the, the rest is just lining ourselves up, you know, for the playoffs because, uh, you know, I've never been more positive about a Padre team in my life. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, uh, We've talked about the strength of this lineup. I think my one question mark right now is the left field position. Again, Tom, uh, Tommy Pham should be coming back, but you know who knows how comfortable he's going to be coming back from that injury. His fill-in so far has pretty much been Jerickson Profar. 
who's, uh, you know, hit only about 200 throughout the year. Uh, so that, that's kind of my one question mark is that's really the only, um, you know, flaw in our lineup at this time. So we'll see how things go from there. Pro, Pro Outside, been, oh, go ahead, Brian. So far has been playing a pretty good left field though. And, and he does work counts. Like it's not an easy at bat. He, he comes up there and if he's our number nine guy, man, that's a heck of a lineup because the pitcher can't fall asleep and can't just groove balls. Like he has the ability to hit for power uh, he has the ability to work counts, see eight, nine, ten pitches in an at-bat. So, yeah, I mean, right now he's the weakest link on the chain, but in years past he would have been the best player on the team. So <laughs> that just kind of tells you where we are. I have a question for you guys. Of all the guys that got dealt from San Diego, which one was the hardest to see leave the team? I'll go – Brian, you can go first. Cal Quantrill for me. Um just because I, you know, every time he goes out there, I feel like he's in control on the mound. I really liked his stuff. Um, yeah, I've just, I've always liked Cal Quantrill, and I think he could be a, a really solid contributor to this team. Um, but, you know, I can root for him in Cleveland and just watch from afar. And some people think he's underperformed in his career, but uh, yeah, I've always liked that guy. Nothing, nothing against him. So I was bummed to see him go, but I understand. Andy? Yeah, for me, it's got to be Ty France, you know, a San Diego State guy, um, uh, a guy that we've been high on, you know, the last couple years. Um, but unfortunately, in this year, there just didn't really seem to be a great spot for him. You know, Jake Cronenworth really solidified the second base spot. There was a thought that maybe he could platoon with Hosmer, um, depending on, you know, how Hosmer was hitting lefties. But, you know, uh, Hosmer has been pretty solid this year. So there really wasn't a great spot for him, especially for a guy that I think should be an everyday starter or, you know, at least an everyday DH. So I think, you know, for him it, in his career, it's good that he goes to a, a team in Seattle where he maybe gets more consistent bats and uh, can maybe be an everyday starter. Um, so it, it was tough to see him go, but I think what we got in return uh, from that trade with Seattle was, was worth it. Yeah, it, it's kind of sad from my end to see Eric Hedges goes. I, I know, you know, all the numbers aside, you know, he, he wasn't hitting great, but he was such a great defensive catcher. And anytime you saw him in the dugout, he seemed like a popular guy. I mean, you know, always in with the, you know, with, with the star players joking around. And you like those type of guys on, on your team because, uh, you know, they get along and, and it just keeps, every, every, you know, the attitude positive in the dugout or on the sidelines in, in any other sport, but that that's a guy I'm going to kind of miss. And, and I hope maybe, maybe, maybe he gets a, you know, a, a role, you know, especially in Cleveland where, where he can start and maybe, you know, with that team being such an offensive force that they don't really need his bat to, to, to do, you know, to, to be a, a major factor in their lineup. So he can actually just play and, and, and be, you know, be, and just show off his defensive skills. Thomas, he's been gone 24 hours, and you already called him uh, the wrong name. He called him Eric Hedges instead of Austin. Oh. That's a manager, wasn't it? <laughs> Shows no. how much you, uh, <laughs> you care about that. Austin game. Hedges, sorry. <laughs> I'm just giving you. Well, guys, we could talk about the Padres, uh, I think, for the, uh, the rest of the day. But... Yeah, let's do it. No, I'm just <laughs> We don't quite have our own talk show yet. <laughs> uh, have you guys been able to, to pay attention to anything else going, in, going on uh, in sports, Brian? I mean, over the last 48 hours, not really. Uh, the trade deadline, especially for the Padres' sake, like we were involved, it seemed, in everything, and there was just no time to pay attention to anything else. Uh, all my free time has been swallowed up by the pods. Um, even though the Lakers are in the middle of the playoffs and the NBA bubble is pretty cool and there's a bunch of talk going on right now in college football on who's playing and who's not. But, yeah, man, it's just been Padres all-consuming uh, on my end. What about you, Thomas? Any I've NBA been, action or anything else? Yeah, I've been really caught up in the NBA. I mean, I, I didn't think I would be, but I've, I've watched a lot of NBA basketball since they started, and I'm really psyched tonight for that for that for that game seven between the Jazz and the uh, and the and the Nuggets. I mean, you know, you, you have two guys that are just scoring at an incredible <laughs> feat. I mean, Mitchell and Murray. I mean. 
you know, I'm expecting them to, to go off again and, and score in, in the high 40s. I mean, at first, when the series started, I thought Utah would, would win easily. But now I watch the Nuggets. I'm like, man, they, they, they might take it. And then, but to me, the, the bottom line is I, I really, after watching all of the NBA, I, I don't see how the Lakers do not win this championship. I don't think there, there's another team that, that is, is so much as a team as, as the Los Angeles Lakers. They really impressed me. But just the way they they kind of they kind of just tired out the Portland Trailblazers to where it was submission. I mean, some of those games were like you, you could have ended those at, at the third quarter because uh, Portland was just tired out. And uh, and and with the Lakers, I, you know, I went into the bubble thinking the the Lakers were were a question mark, and I come out of the first round thinking, man, I, I don't see how they lose. I, I don't see a team. In, in that bubble right now that can defeat them in a, in a seven game series. Yeah. They've, they've been pretty impressive, uh, you know, especially winning that first series. And then I think, you know, Brian, you're the, you're the big Lakers guy. I think they have like four or five days off before, you know, they would play the first game in their next series. Yeah. Especially because the, uh, the other series, which I wanted to talk about just for a second is going to seven games between Houston and Oklahoma city um, at the beginning of the season, like in the off season, when Oklahoma City traded Russell Westbrook to Houston and everybody thought that meant, you know, Oklahoma City was going to have Chris Paul and a bunch of young kids and they were kind of giving up and Houston was going for it. Like, oh, we're going to go get Russ and uh, this is going to be the team. And now those two teams are fighting it out in the first round and they're going to a game seven. Like how cool for Chris Paul to go into a, a situation in Oklahoma City where everybody thought this season was just a concession and he goes into the team that traded him and he's got a shot to lead the youngsters mm -hmm. past them into the second round. That would be so cool. So that, that's another intriguing thing I'm watching. Yeah, I think what I love is that, I mean, obviously, you know, it's been a crazy year and won't, won't um, you know, forget everything that's going on in the world. But with the, the pushback of the NBA season, you know, we're getting towards October when the NBA season normally starts. So to have it end, this year when the baseball playoffs are coming up, the start of the NFL season, I mean, I think we're two weeks away from the start of the NFL. And we I haven't know. even you know, talked anything NFL yet. We'll definitely do that you know, coming up here on a, on a podcast soon. But for all that to be happening, man, it, it's the best time of the year in sports. Uh, I'll give you guys one final word on, on your thoughts on everything going on. Start with you, Thomas. Sorry, Austin. I called you error. <laughs> I still like you as a catcher. <laughs> Brian, any I'll, I'll go, I'll go, uh, I'll go Phil Mickelson. I, uh, I watched his champions tour debut as I was thinking about things I've, I've watched during uh, this Padres craziness. And uh, it was really cool to see him go out and play and, and put up a huge number and tie the, uh, the scoring mark for the champions tour and win in his debut outing. Um, one of the holes he outdrove his playing partner by 120 yards. And it was, it was just awesome. Like he's hitting low irons in and these other guys are hitting, you know, three iron, two iron from 200 something yards away and Phil's hitting a, a wedge. So it was pretty awesome. And he, he made a ton of putts and it looked like he was having fun out there. So he's making the, uh, the champions tour worthwhile watching the other golf tournament this weekend uh, a couple of huge putts, one by Dustin Johnson and then one by John Rahm to win from 60-something feet away, like a quadruple breaker. That was really cool. So golf's kind of got my attention, too. I forgot about that. Yeah, and then just in two weeks, we have the, the U.S. Open out at uh, Wingfoot, New York. So, yeah. so much going on. Brian and Thomas, thanks for joining me again. Uh, we'll do it again soon. Take care. Bye.